Hey guys, what's up? I'm Captain Mike and welcome back to Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus. Uh, today, really neat topic, something I'm very passionate about. We are going to talk about mutton snapper fishing, okay? But not your everyday, ordinary mutton snapper fishing because there's a lot of ways to target these fish. But specifically, we're going to be talking about jigging for big mutton snappers. A very, very specialized fishery. You really have to be, oh gosh, you know, passionate about jig fishing and patient and really willing to put in your time in order to achieve success, you know, when you're really trying to catch these big mutton snappers on jigs. Now, as you guys know, I'm down here in the Florida Keys, I'm fishing at a marathon. Uh, been down here for a year, learned a tremendous amount so far. There's still so much more to learn. So really just a phenomenal venue down here. Uh, and But certainly a lot of what we're talking about is applicable in a lot of different places. You know, I'm going to share with you what I've learned here in the Middle Keys. But of course, it's applicable throughout the entire Florida Keys Island chain, uh, out in the Gulf, Bahamas, pretty much anywhere mutton snapper live, right? Uh, but again, I've tailored my approach to the mutton snapper fishery down here. So let me just, you know, before I dig in, let me just preface all of this and say, hey, listen, you better be into mutton snapper and you better be into jig fishing if you want to take advantage of this. Because like I said earlier, it's very detail oriented. You've got to be willing to put, a, put in the time and you've got to be willing to potentially sacrifice other fisheries as well in order to maximize your efforts doing what we're going to talk about here today. So, systematically speaking, let's talk about how we do this. You know, how did I even get into this? Well, mutton snapper are absolutely one of my favorite target species. Why? They're very challenging to catch. You know, the smaller fish, you know, keepers now 18 inches, the 18 to 20 inch fish, they're on the reef, you know, they're in a lot of different places and relatively relatively easier to catch, right? Mixed in with yellowtails, mangroves, um, they're on open bottom out in the Gulf, you know, decent fish. The bigger fish, the fish approaching 30 inches, the real super slob muttons, okay? These men are brilliant. These fish didn't get big by being dumb, I promise you that. They're super, super smart. They have an incredible sense of smell, an incredible sense of their surroundings. Um, you know, if it doesn't, you guys have heard me say this, right? If it doesn't look right, smell right, taste right, or move right, they're not going to eat it. Um, and they can be incredibly picky. You guys out there who are avid mutton snapper fishermen, you know exactly what I'm talking about. One day they may want ballyhoo, the next day they may want pinfish, the next day they may want, you know, a butterfly goggle eye. Um, a lot of different offerings for these fish. And, you know, interestingly, actually, on the topic of bait, one of the most effective mutton snapper baits that I've ever fished is a fresh king mackerel steak. So just think about that for a second. Here's just a fresh piece of king mackerel, but it's got to be fresh, not frozen thawed. Fresh, fresh. And they just absolutely love that. I don't know if it's the smell that attracts them, um, but they, they can't resist it. But that's a topic of a you know different discussion at a different time. Like I said, what we're talking about is jig fishing these, you know, and strictly jigs, strictly artificials. Why do it? Well, the challenge. For me, it's about the challenge. It's about saying, hey, I want to go out, catch this trophy mutton snapper, this beautiful 30-inch fish, you know, approaching 15 to 18 pounds, maybe even a little bit more. By the way, the state record is 30 pounds, so there are some real giants out there. Um, but it's just about that challenge, right? It's so gratifying to me to say, hey, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to look for these mutton snappers, and I'm going to target them, chase them, and try and fool them to eat a piece of metal, this brilliant fish that is so hard to catch. Uh, and when I'm successful, it's just an incredibly rewarding experience, you know. For me, I'd rather catch one on a jig than three or four on bait. Not everybody's the same way, you know, I'm fortunate, I feel like I've caught a lot of big mutton snappers in my days, um, and now it's about catching them the way that I want to catch them, you know, and again, that's with the jig fishing, because as you guys also know, I'm an avid jig fisherman. Slow pitch jigging, you know, all sorts of jigging, but certainly slow pitch jigging. 
So down here, Florida Keys, first thing I needed to do, I've been down here about a year, and I say to myself, hey, if you really want to get into finding and fooling these big mutton snappers, you know, what's the first thing you need to do? And I'm like, well, the first thing is I need to find where are the mutton snappers, right? I've got to find them. That's first and foremost, you know, before I can even attempt to go out there and target these fish on jigs, I've got to find them. So I start doing my homework. I network with a lot of other local captains down here. And here I am, even though I've been fishing my entire life, founder and publisher of Florida Sport Fishing Magazine for two decades. I've got a television series for over 10 years. Not everybody is so willing to just open up their, you know, log books or open up their chart plotter and go, hey, here's a series of numbers. You know, here's a whole bunch of numbers where you can go out and find these big mutton snappers. No, 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 no. It just doesn't work like that. Nor would I ask anybody for that because, you know, I know how much time and effort and, and hard work it took to, to build that bank of numbers. And it's wrong of me to just say, hey, just give them to me. You know what I'm saying? And it's wrong of you to do that too. So you've got to really put in the time. I studied every chart that I could possibly study about the middle keys to really excuse me, familiarize myself with the lay of the land. I networked, like I said, with other captains, getting as much information as I possibly could in as many different areas as I could possibly get it. Now, from there, I pieced it all together. And I said, hey, you know what? These big mutton snappers, I know where they are. They're in 150, approximately 150 to 250 feet of water. That's the zone, right, for the big ones. Not to say you can't catch them in shallower water because you can, but that's not what we're talking about today because I'm not going to be jigging on the reef in 30 feet of water. It's just not an applicable, you know, scenario for me. So I need some deep water. So 150 to 250 feet, structure. We all know mutton snappers relate to structure. There's no doubt about that. So I've got to find the structure. First and foremost, what do you think is Rex? Well, to me, up from the Fort Lauderdale area, Tri-County area up there, when somebody says, hey, we're going to fish a wreck, we're going to fish a wreck, a wreck, 100, 2, 3, 500 foot freighter, some giant sunken ship on the bottom of the ocean, wreck. Here in the Florida Keys, a wreck could be something like a dishwasher. A wreck could be a small little pile of debris. That's what they call a wreck down here. So when you hear the word wreck across the Florida Keys, don't automatically assume that it's this big, giant, submerged ship. And that's what you're looking for, because that is not the case. There are a number of sunken ships, wrecks per se, you know, here, but not a lot. Okay. Most of the piles, most of the debris where you're going to find these big mutton snappers are small piles of debris. Okay, It could be just a dimple. It could be you know, just a very small hump on your machine, on your sounder. Um, so you really have to understand that in order to know where to look for these mutton snappers, the big ones. You need to understand that they don't sit still. That a mutton snapper is not like a grouper that sits in a hole. You know, a mutton snapper roams the bottom. He's, you know, he's an, I don't want to say an open water predator because he's not, but he will roam that bottom all around that structure looking for a meal. He may be 100 yards, 200 yards away from any sort of wreck. And remember what we said about a wreck, it could be a very small pile of debris. So he could be anywhere around there, but certainly he's going to be related to that structure. So if I can find and pinpoint all of those key points, well, certainly I now have a bank of areas to go look for these snappers. So that's first and foremost what I did is I built this library of spots. Next thing I did is I went out and fished all of these spots with bait. Pinfish, live pinfish. Why? Super hardy bait, easy to catch, easy to keep alive. Mutton snappers love them, so do everything else. African pompano, blackfin tuna, king mackerel, all sorts of jack species, 
of course, a variety of snappers and groupers all eat cobias. They all eat the pinfish. So it's a great scouting bait to learn an area, to see what's around, and to be incredibly effective. So I went out and I did that dozens and dozens and dozens of times, many, many times, and had tremendous success. Not every day, because these big mutton snappers don't bite every day. They could be there and just not biting. Okay, sometimes it's like flicking a light switch where they'll turn on maybe during a certain tide, uh, the current is reacting a certain way, and they'll turn on and they'll feed. On other occasions, lights out, baby. They could be there and you can't buy a bite. You can't catch a single fish. So every day is different, okay, every day. And that's another reason that I really like going out and catching these mutton snappers, chasing these mutton snappers. Remember what I said earlier about it's challenging? Well, you're damn right it is. It's very challenging. Knowing that it's not like a kingfish or a dolphin where generally you find them, you're going to catch them. Not the same with the mutton snappers, okay? Not the same at all. Incredible, incredible predator. But it's all about the challenge. Nevertheless, I went out and I fished them with bait, had tremendous success, and then I said, okay, now I'm ready to go chase these fish with a jig. And just no natural bait whatsoever, just to jig these fish. Everybody that I talk to down here in the Keys, a lot of the old timers, the old salts, guys that have been down here for decades, yeah, they said, no, not going to happen. You know, nobody fishes jigs for the mutton snappers down here. Some guys will drop a big bucktail for groupers with a ballyhoo on it. You know, various different venues and scenarios like that. But who wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to go chase 15 to 20 pound trophy mutton snappers with a jig. Just a metal lure and nothing else. Nobody says that. Except for me. I say that. I decide that I'm going to go out and do this because it's what I love to do and it's what really attracts me about fishing and about the Florida Keys is I have all of these incredible opportunities, you know, these unique opportunities that may not be available in a lot of other places and I like to take advantage of them. So I went out, I tried a lot of different stuff and I'm not going to talk to you about everything that's failed because we'll be here for hours, okay? I'm going to talk to you about what's been successful and really narrowing all you know narrowing it all down to one rod one reel one jig one rig that's it i literally can go out there and fish for these big muttons with one outfit and a single jig and again this is through trial and error like i said this is a big big strong fish okay and we can't lose sight of that these things and i'm just going to kind of show you a little replica here Okay, of a trophy of this is the these are the fish that we're targeting right here. This is a 30 inch mutton. Look at that amazing fish. How absolutely gorgeous is that? Okay, I mean not only the coloration, the size, and again this this mount happens to be from King Sailfish, just the best release mounts in the business, hands down. Um, but it just does a great job of showing the predator that we're after. Look at that big, powerful tail, the broom-like tail, those large fins. Okay, that fish has incredibly powerful jaws. He'll swim up to a bait, he'll sniff it out, and when he commits, he commits. He just inhales that entire bait, and then he'll go scooting and racing across the bottom. You're not going to slam the brakes on a 30-inch mutton snapper on his first run, okay? It's just not going to happen. Let's put this guy down for a second here. So you have to be prepared to dog it out and battle it out with an amazing bottom fish, okay? Um, so it's no place for really light tackle. But at the same token, you don't want to fish incredibly heavy gear because obviously fatigue will set in. So it's all about finding that balance. So we're going to step back a second. We know where the muttons are, 150 to 250 feet. They're around all sorts of debris and structure. Okay, real important that you focus your efforts on that sort of bottom. You're going to need to do your homework. I'm not going to sit here and just go, here are some GPS numbers, um, but I'm pretty much handing it to you. I'm telling you that there are resources out there, you know, 
Uh, I use a Furuno TZ Touch 3 version 2 software with a personal bathymetric generator. I'm literally creating 3D images of the bottom as I drift or as I troll. Um, and I'm constantly paying attention to ridges and drop-offs and trenches because they're all potential hot spots for the big muttons. I use every resource I can. Seymour, you know, chips, we're all familiar with them. They provide a tremendous amount of data. It's priceless. Okay, it really is. Good electronics, I can't say enough. My Furuno network, you know, my sounder, my DFF3D, man, the, the situational awareness, the information that's being provided to me is just essential. And I'm digesting it all. I'm not making notes, but I'm making mental notes, okay? And I'm digesting it all and really helping me narrow down the search for these incredible fish. And, of course, where I've caught them before, right? I mean, because trust me, these, are, these fish are, you know, creatures of habit. If you've caught a mutton snapper on a particular wreck, reef, rubble pile, go back there because there will be other mutton snapper there. There was something that drew that fish to that area, and that same characteristics of that piece are going to draw other mutton snapper. So that, of course, is absolutely you know vital information. Making a note of every place you've caught mutton snapper. Time of the year here in the Florida Keys, the fall through spring is when we tend to see the larger mutton snapper. Okay, the bigger fish, these 30 inch fish that I just showed you. Okay, fall through spring, winter time, man, hot bite right there in the winter time. Yeah, you have to deal with some conditions at times, but it can certainly be incredibly rewarding. You're also going to have a lot of other bycatch mixed in, some really beautiful trophy fish. But again, this is not about the bycatch because that's not what we're targeting. We're targeting the big mutton snappers. Time of the day, I got to tell you, I mean, I've even caught them at night. Gone and out jigging for them at night and I've caught them. But usually, you know, sunrise to midday seems to be the best bite. Sometimes it's tidal driven, the outgoing tide, you know, or even incoming, but moving water. You may not think tide plays a role so far offshore in 200 feet, but it absolutely does. Um, it plays just as much of a role as it does on the flats, just in a different way. So moving water is often very, very important. Um, I find that, of course, all of my jig fishing is drift fishing. I'm drifting. I'm not anchored, okay? I'm not powering into the, I'm not, you know, motoring into the current. I'm drifting all of the time. So I've got to have some decent conditions to drift. I want some breeze. I want some current. But I don't want it to be crazy because if I can't keep my jig in the strike zone on or near the bottom because I'm moving too fast, well, that certainly could be a problem. So the sweet spot is really 0.5 to 1 knot. You know, that's really half a knot to a knot. I'm moving. I'm covering ground. But I'm able to really have an effective presentation. Um, so, you know, there's times 1.1, 1.2, 1.5, but it becomes really challenging once you approach, you know, or exceed a knot and a half of current, it becomes challenging to maintain that vertical presentation, and that's really going to be key, because once you're scoped way out, you lose that appeal. Um, no current at all is probably even worse because you're just sitting in one spot. Nothing is happening. Everything is sitting still. You're sitting in one spot. The jig is just bouncing up and down. A lot of time for the fish to evaluate what's happening. A lot of time for that fish to pinpoint something that may not look natural. So I'd almost say I'd rather be drifting too fast than not drifting at all. Because drifting too fast, I can make some adjustments. I can go to a heavier jig. I can go to lighter braid to help myself maintain that vertical presentation. But there's not much I can do if I'm just sitting still. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, so that pretty much sets the stage for where we're going to look for these mutton snappers, when we're going to look for the mutton snappers, what conditions that we're looking for, and understand, you know, I always talk about being properly prepared and taking advantage of, you know, whatever opportunity comes your way, and you may want to do that. You know, you could, when you're out there jigging for muttons, like I said, you're in 150 to 250. 
prime zone for so many other game fish. Fish some baits up on top if you want. You could somebody could put a kite up and dangle some kite baits while you're you know uh, drifting and jigging. All sorts of stuff that you can do. You can fish bait, you know, on the bottom while you're also jigging, you know. But again, that's not what we're talking about. Um, to a point where I'm leaving the dock with nothing but my jigging outfits because I'd rather just really focus zero in on that fish and to try and just catch that fish without worrying about everything else. Is it the most effective way to catch as many fish as possible? No. Okay, like I said, get a team of guys together, cover the water column from top to bottom using a variety of methods, and of course you're going to catch a lot of different species. But I can tell you I don't think there's anything as challenging as this, nor as rewarding. So the tackle. You guys know a couple of years ago, you know, when I first got into slow pitch jigging after a lot of trial and error there and a variety of prototypes, we actually designed and launched our own series of slow pitch jigging rods and I still stand behind them till today just an absolute perfect balance the rod is six foot three it's rated for 150 to 400 grams um, incredibly light it's built on a carbon fiber a Torre carbon fiber blank from black hole Fuji graphite components you know like I said incredibly light it's matched to a Daiwa Saltiga 30HA. You can even fish the smaller size. I think it's a 20HA. Um, you don't need a tremendous amount of line because this 30-pound diamond braid is so ultra thin, and I'm only fishing 250 feet of water. I'm not fishing 800 feet of water. So you can use a, I don't want to say a micro reel, but you, you can get away with a micro reel also. Um, but this is just the perfect balance for me. I've got a lot of line capacity um, because also, you know, I should mention everything eats the jig. And we're going to talk about that jig in a second. But everything eats the jig. And we've caught 65-pound Wahoo on a jig on the same outfit. You don't have a lot of line on that reel. You could be in trouble. Excuse me. The reel, like I said, a Daiwa Saltiga. 30 HA, a lot of line capacity, small, I can palm it right there, incredibly comfortable, super smooth and silky drag, it's a star drag, so very easy to apply a little bit more or a little bit less pressure, and I'm adjusting the drag a lot when I'm mutton fishing. I'm constantly checking it, um, and I'm doing a lot of adjusting on the drag, and the star drag, for me, is just a really convenient and easy way to jig these fish. Single speed, I don't need a two-speed reel in this scenario. Very simple. The reel is loaded with fresh 30-pound diamond braid. Again, that's the right balance. If I'm fishing deeper water, a lot of current, I may bring it down to 20-pound. But in this scenario, 150 to 250, under 95% of the scenario, you know, the conditions, the 30-pound is ideal. These are strong, big fish, and I'm telling you, you're going to hook some serious sea monsters. All sorts of stuff, all the way up to 300 pound sharks, okay? And like I said, even some pelagics. So you really want reliable, strong line. And that 30 pound diamond braid is vital. I connect the braid to a 25 foot top shot of 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon. Again, I'm telling you exactly how I fish. If something's working for you, stick with it, do it, great. I'm not trying to convince you to do it a different way. I'm simply sharing with you exactly how I do it. Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus is about teaching you. It's about shortening that learning curve, and that's exactly what I'm doing. So it's absolutely a perfect place for you to start. 25 feet, 40 pound diamond presentation fluorocarbon connected to the braid with an Alberto knot. Very simple knot. More importantly, very small. You can see the guides on this slow pitch rod are very small. And I don't want a knot to get caught up in that guide, especially up in that small, tiny tip top. So use a very small knot. An FG knot is equally as effective, but the Alberto is much faster to tie. From there, the end of the leader is actually tied right to the solid ring on the top of the jig. Some guys will put a barrel swivel on the top of the jig. They believe it gives their jig more action. I'm not one of those guys. It's a matter of preference. I find that I just tie, you know, with an improved clinch knot right to the, let me show you this a little bit closer. You can see it's tied 
right to that solid ring right there, okay? And the solid ring is attached to a split ring, which is where my hooks are attached, which is where the jig is attached, and the same on the bottom. A split ring attached to the jig and attached to the hooks. Now, perhaps the most important part of the entire equation is the jig itself. Through tremendous trial and error, okay, I have finally zeroed in on what I believe is the absolute epitome of the perfect jig for mutton snapper. And you guys know again that I've been following me for a long time. I introduced a variety of slow pitch jigs uh, back when I owned and published Florida Sport Fishing Magazine. Uh, no longer the case, by the way, if you're not sure about that or if you're unfamiliar with that. I haven't owned that magazine in a couple of years um, and just been focusing all of our efforts on TV. Those are still great jigs, but like everything else, Products evolve, technology has evolved, and I have been involved with a new jig design that I'm telling you is just incredible. It's called the Mobster. That's what the name of that jig is. It's called the Mobster. Now, what's unique about that jig is a couple of different things. Number one, it's three-sided. It's not two-sided. So as you can see, we've got one side, two side, three sides. Okay, three-sided. That gives this jig tremendous wobble in the water. It's long and skinny. Now, when you look at that jig right there, and you're down here in the Florida Keys, and I say to you, what's the number one forage down here in the Florida Keys during the winter time when the largest mutton snapper are in that zone that I'm going to be targeting them? What's the number one forage here during that winter time? And your answer better be ballyhoo. Well, there it is, baby. That's a ballyhoo. That's better than a ballyhoo, and I'll tell you why. First of all, a live or a fresh ballyhoo, you have to catch, purchase, do whatever it is you're going to do with it. You've got to rig it. You've got to drop it to the bottom. A lot of the little, you know, smaller fish may peck at it. It's a great bait. Make no mistake. A live ballyhoo dropped to the bottom is, is a great bait for mutton snappers. It, it's such a great bait. That that's exactly my logic. It's saying, well, what if I could drop my own live ballyhoo down there into the strike zone? But not only drop it down there, what if I can control it? How I want it to swim? How fast? How slow? How erratic? How smooth? And what if I want to keep it right there in that strike zone, 10 feet or less off the bottom? Because keep in mind, I've learned with these jigs that once that jig is out of that strike zone, more than 10 feet off the bottom, my chances of hooking a mutton snapper have reduced dramatically. My chances of hooking a blue runner, a bonita, a barracuda, a small kingfish, or any other variety of pelagics begins to increase tremendously. So I keep my jig very, very close to the bottom. I'll work it 10 feet off the bottom, and then I'll drop it right back down. 10 feet off the bottom, drop it right back down. And I'm constantly working that zone right there, 10 feet off the bottom. Once my line is scoped out away from the boat, depending on the current, I will retrieve it, I'll reel it all the way back up to the boat, double check everything, drop it right back down. Now when you start to think about that, if there was somebody fishing right alongside me, fishing a live bait, they drop their rig to the bottom with a fish finder rig, or maybe they have their sinker, you know, with a dropper loop, however it is they do it. And they drop a live bait to the bottom. And you drift, you know, over a likely area alongside some sort of debris. The entire time, their bait is in that strike zone. Okay, the entire drift, if that drift is maybe a quarter mile long, whatever it may be, who knows, or if it's 200 yards long, their, their bait's down there. Well, I've got to do the same with mine, you know, with keeping this jig right there in that strike zone for maximum, you know, time. But like I said, when it scopes out, I've got to reel it all the way back up and start over again, and I'm losing a lot of valuable fishing time. So I've got to take all of that into consideration in order to maximize my time in that strike zone. I fish a 250 gram jig. It's the Mobster 250, okay? That's the jig that I fish. They come in a wide variety of sizes from 150 to 500 grams. I don't care about any of those. I care about the 250. 
This has just been the money jig. It's the perfect balance allowing me to achieve that ideal presentation that I'm looking for. Okay. I fish a very natural silvery color pattern. I don't go with pinks, purples, greens, yellows, neons. Not to say that those jigs don't catch fish, but remember what I said earlier. Does that look like a ballyhoo or does that look like a ballyhoo? And that's what I'm trying to mimic is a ballyhoo. So regardless of any of those other colors, one thing that I know for sure is that mimics a ballyhoo. And that's what the most important factor is to me. The hooks, I outfit the Mobster 250 with 5.0 VMC tech set dual assist jig hooks. They're incredibly sharp, but more importantly, they're incredibly strong. You can't bend these hooks. You just can't bend them. And these fish are so strong, these big mutton snappers, that if you fish a weak hook, they'll clean your clock. Okay, it will absolutely straighten the hook. It's happened to me multiple times using inferior hooks, and it'll happen to you as well. I finally, I don't want to say I finally, VMC finally introduced assist hooks. It's probably one of the happiest days of my life. And since then, I've been fishing nothing else, okay, on all of my jigs. And balance it. Like I said, the 5.0 size seems to be absolutely ideal for that 250 grand mobster. I drop that jig down into the strike zone. I work it 10 feet off the bottom, right back down 10 feet off the bottom, working it erratically the entire time. I'm thinking about that jig. I'm thinking about what it's doing, how it's acting, how it's reacting. I'm controlling it. I'm bringing it to life. This jig is in my hands. Its life is in my hands. And I tell you what, it's just incredible what you can do with this three-sided mobster. You know, drop it in the water right next to the boat. Drop it down 10 feet. Lift the rod up and watch the jig. Pitch it. Watch it shoot over to the side, wobble down. Pitch it again. Watch it shoot over and wobble down. And just think about how that's reacting right on the bottom. There's many times you'll hit the bottom, you'll lock it up, you go to pitch the jig, and instantly crash, it just gets clobbered. And you're like convinced the jig is just laying on the bottom. You haven't even moved it yet. I really think what's happening there is the mutton snapper saw that jig falling. He watched it because they're not stupid. He watched it. He watched that wounded bait coming down. It, you know, and, and it hit the sea floor, and suddenly the second you go to move it, it just twitches just that tiny little bit, and that creates just enough movement for him to instinctively just attack that bait and just inhale it. And trust me, the bites that you get from the big mutton snappers are not nibbles. They kill this jig. It, you know, they're incredibly powerful, and you feel it all the way through your bones. You certainly do. Now, once that fish eats that jig, that big mutton snapper, your rod's going to just absolutely bend double over. The fish is going to go skating across the bottom because, you know, he feels those hooks. And really, at that point, I don't even think he feels the hooks yet. I think he ate the bait, and he's running off with the bait because he's trying to force that bait, you know, down his throat. He doesn't want it to escape, and he doesn't even realize what's happening yet until he starts to slow down and then suddenly, wait a minute, something's not kosher here, right? And now the battle really begins. At that point, let that fish go. He's going to be screaming line off your reel. Don't try and lock it up and slam on the drag and, you know, think you're going to stop him because something will fail. I promise you, you will experience premature tackle failure. Let the fish do its thing. Let him run off until he starts to slow down a little and then begin to slowly coerce that fish up to the surface. And you're in for an absolute serious battle. Take your time. Finesse. Know your tackle. Know it incredibly well. I know just how much pressure I could put on this outfit. And it's a lot. It's a lot more than you may think, okay? I mean, you just can... It's crazy how much heat you can put on a fish with this outfit and not jeopardize the tackle. My biggest concern, you know, because I have so much confidence in all of this, I'm not worried about the hook straightening out. I'm not worried about my knots failing. I'm not worried about my leader failing because it's not frayed. I'm constantly making sure there are no nicks or abrasions. So I count on my entire outfit. I'm just afraid I'm going to put so much heat on them that I may pull a hook out of them. 
But because you're fishing four hooks, you know, dual assist hooks on the top and on the bottom of the jig, there's a good chance there's more than one hook in that fish. So just keep that in mind too. Um, you know, I can't stress it enough. It's incredibly rewarding to go out here and say, hey, I'm going to go out and target this trophy fish, but I'm not only going to target the trophy fish, I'm going to target it the way that I want to catch it. And to go out and do it and to achieve the results that you're looking for is really the pinnacle of what game fishing and sport fishing is all about. It's pure hunting. You know, it is. It's saying, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to hunt this territory where these fish are and do everything I can do to coerce that fish to bite. You know, on some days I may catch one, on some days I may catch five. I'm definitely going to see a lot of action because what eats ballyhoo? Everything eats ballyhoo, okay? Everything. So, yeah, while I'm targeting the mutton snappers, I'm going to see a lot of what I call junk fish, you know, the blue runners, the bonitas. I'm going to see mackerel, blackfin tunas, cobias, kingfish. Uh, heck, just caught a wahoo doing this exact same thing just two days ago. Excuse me, just two days ago. So, you know, prepare. Prepare for a lot of action. You're going to be reeling a lot. You're going to be going up and down a lot. Don't think you're just going to go out there and drop a jig down and in five minutes you're going to hook a 30 pound, I mean a 30 inch mutton snapper. It's not going to happen, nor should it happen. You're going to have to sacrifice a lot of other fisheries. You're going to have to zero in your mindset and say, hey, okay, I'm going to focus on this. I'm going to go out here and do this. Yeah, I know there's guys that are catching dolphin offshore. Yeah, I know there's guys that are catching yellowtails and mangroves on the reef. I don't care about any of that. Yeah, I know there's guys that are doing this or doing that. That makes no difference to me. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm focused on doing. And I'll tell you, don't be under the impression that it's not equally, if not more effective than fishing a live bait, because it can be. To you, this may be a piece of metal. To me, this is a live ballyhoo, and it's an unlimited resource. I have unlimited live ballyhoo in my hand with one jig. It's every single time I drop it down, it's super fresh and super lively. Okay, that's how I look at it. It's not, you know, because of course you could hook a ballyhoo and the thing, they're fragile, it could die, it could spin in circles, you know, a million different things can happen. Well, that's not happening with my ballyhoo. My live ballyhoo is frisky yeah, and he's wounded, but he's reacting the way I want him to react. He's doing exactly what I want him to do, where I want him to do it. Which brings me to my next point, jig awareness. That's what I call it, jig awareness. Always know where your jig is in the water column. Always pay close attention. You know, you don't need colored line, segmented line to tell you that. Pay attention. Pop open your bail. Put your thumb on the spool. Let the jig fall to the bottom. How long does it take to fall to the bottom? It's going to go boop. It's going to hit the bottom. You're going to feel it. You lock up your reel. You now start jigging. You're going to know you're approximately 10 feet off the bottom, close to the bottom, 20 feet at the very most before you drop it back down. Drop it back down, etc. Do this enough times and you're going to get into this rhythm and you're going to understand where your jig is at all times. And that's very, very important is to have jig awareness. It's very important to have a nice fluid rhythm while you're jigging, okay? And everybody has a different pattern. You know, you just heard me say that a couple days ago, out there jigging for the muttons and caught a nice, I mean, a nice wahoo on the jig. I happened to have been fishing with my nephew and my brother, and we were all doing identically the same thing, fishing the same outfit with the same jig. Three of us lined up alongside the boat, you know, one in the bow, one in the stern, me at midship. And I remember looking up at my nephew and then looking over at my brother and looking at my own rhythm, and we all have these three distinct rhythms, but yet we all got bites. You know, we all saw action, and we were all effective. So there's not one way. There's a lot of ways. The key is just keep that jig moving. Keep it alive. Don't let it just sit still. If you, had a, if you were in really deep water and you had a lot of scope, there's times you can just hold your rod steady, and that jig is just fluttering on its own because you've got a lot of scope out there, okay? That's not the case when you're fishing 150 to 250 feet of water. You're primarily straight up and down. And like I said, once you're scoped a little bit too far out, I reel it back up 
and I start over again, okay? So at the end of the day, not something that everyone is gonna do. This may or may not be for you, but for me, it is just an unbelievable experience, something I'm very, very passionate about. And I'll tell you what, it's perhaps the most rewarding fishery that I've ever experienced is going out and trying to catch these big trophy muttons with the mobster. If you want to get your hands on these jigs, they're only sold on one website, jigsareus.com. Very simple, jigsareus.com. You can't buy it from me. I don't sell them. Okay, I need to get my hands on them just like you do. Um, so check it out, jigsareus.com, the mobster 250. Okay, mention Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus. I have mentioned to them that I'm going to be, uh, you know, talking about this jig. And, you know, we agreed that anybody who calls and mentions Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus will receive their jigs rigged and ready to fish. So makes it even easier for you. That's it. If you need more information about this fishery or any other fishery, remember one of the membership benefits with Florida Sport Fishing TV Plus is a 24-7 helpline. You can email me, mike at floridasportfishing.com. Any questions, comments, concerns regarding any topic related to saltwater fishing in Florida, and I'll absolutely do the very best that I can to uh, help you out. So good luck, and uh, hopefully once this wind lays down outside, you know, over the next couple of days, we'll be back out there looking for more big muttons on the Mobster 250. I'll see you out there.